step four. Everybody just do your thing. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. 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 Welcome, welcome, welcome to Tales from the Field. We are back and better than ever, and it is so good to have you with us. My name is Bradley Ball, and on Tuesday, we had Pam Lahoud, Principal Program Manager from the Azure Data PG. Pam owns SQL VMs and the amazing double sprinkles and regular sprinkles. Uh, we talked about future releases such as Chocolate Fudge and Bacon. Uh, Dan hosted, I was disqualified again. Naraj won. Congratulations, Naraj. He has hosting duties for next Tuesday. If you haven't seen that episode, don't worry. Stay right there. All of our shows are posted to YouTube after our live stream, and you can check it out at your convenience. If you want to interact with the show, head over to our LinkedIn profile, SQL Balls. Uh, you can also go to our YouTube channel, or you could go to Josh Ludeman on Twitter, Naraj Jafari on Twitter, Bradley uh, SQL Balls on Twitter, and you'll be able to interact with the show. One of my lovely co-host will be able to see your comment and add it to the stream there's our good buddy dan taylor and of course he's calling out that you were disqualified again yes i again. know again yeah. again <laughs> uh, don't forget we are less than two weeks away from live 360 and the past summit for live 360 sign up for live 360 sign up for our pre-con buck woody josh ludeman myself doing the sequel ground to cloud workshop it's going to be a hands-on workshop uh, on Sunday. We can't wait to see you there. It's going to be a lot of fun. As if it couldn't get any better than that, let me introduce my co-hosts. Uh, we have Andreas Bedelia, Josh Ludeman, and I don't know if you know this, but he's kind of a big deal around here. My friend and yours, Naraj Jafari. But wait, there's more. We have a special guest with us today, Matt Gordon, five-time, count it, five, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, Senior Ar Architect for Centric Consulting, He's an author, he's got a new book out, he's a blogger, he's a presenter at many international conferences, user groups. Uh, he is a social media sentiment guru for the Men and Blazers podcast. One of my favorite Halloween guests ever because he played one hell of a Saint Frankenstein. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. That that intro makes it sound like I, I know what I'm doing. So I don't know, that that's a lot to live up to. Uh, I trust me, you deliver, uh, deliver in spades. I mean, the beard in and of itself. I haven't seen a beard that good since I was looking at Andreas. <laughs> I think he's got me beat, but yeah, fair enough. I, I may have to clean this up. I... Oh, oh what, what was it? What's that, Josh? You don't like being disqualified and left out of things? Oh, 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 oh. Well, you're the only one qualified to be disqualified, so you mm -hmm. have to be disqualified. Yeah, I would never want to be a part of a club that would have me as a member. Um, Andreas, you were a miss, but Dan did a great job filling in for you Tuesday. We didn't get, get to catch up with you. How was your weekend and how's your week going? Um, it was a great week, but it was a little disconcerting knowing that you guys replaced Andreas uh, 1.0 with the 2.0 version. Um, however, mm -hmm. I see a lot of uh, uh, bug issues with that. So we're going to have to roll back to 1.0 and, you know. Stick with 1.0 for a while. Well, as a matter of fact, Dan. I think Dan is actually going to be with us next Tuesday because oh. uh, you aren't able to. So uh, let's like <laughs> roll him back forward yeah. to uh, yeah. 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, Dan uh, Naraj stole the show with his tales from the uh, field from technology fields. He, he really did. Uh, that's part of the reason that that he went. And one of my favorite things about Matt, Dan, you're absolutely right. He really races race cars. I mean, he is SQL at speed on Twitter. But he, I mean, race cars are a real thing. Matt, I've, I've seen the pictures. We've talked about it for years. Um, God, you're such a busy man. You've got so much going on. You're presenting at the Past Summit. You got your new book out. You're racing cars. Uh, what are you excited about? Talk to us, buddy. All of it. Um, so, yeah, we'll go in chronological order here. Um, so, yeah, I'm speaking at Past Summit in, let's uh, 12, 13 days. I'm not good at math. Um, I likely will be beardless there because I have to match my headshot. Because you don't want people going to the site be like, all right, this is one of the guys who's supposed to be speaking and then walk in and, and I've got this. So so I'll be I, I don't know. I, I don't think you should do that. I, th I think you should macho like Hulk Hogan it uh, and, and just like take off the beard and, and maybe <laughs> leave some big old chops. That, that'll be kind of interesting. I, you know, I could consider that, um, but I think I think probably not. But I will uh, I'll take that under advisement. 
that's um, that's fair. That's fair. So uh, tell tell us about uh, your new book, maybe. Yeah. So what? it. Um, so I was really honored to be asked to be a part of this. Um, so it's a book that Kevin Klein, one of the people who invented past sequel family legend, um, had started an effort to talk about basically. Uh, I, the title is Pro Database Migration to Azure. And it's, you know, there are some how to elements in there, but it's really kind of a level up from that where managers, team leads, executives, however you're structured, the people that might lead that, um, it's really more for them to be like, here are the questions that you should be asking. Here's some stuff you may hear from marketing executives, sales folks, whatever, um, that is not accurate, according to us. Um, and then kind of a, a bit of how to, where how to, how to guide your people to actually executing those, what to watch out for, all that stuff. So all, all four of us have participated in those because there were th three other co-authors on there. And uh, we've all been part of some good ones and some challenging ones as well. So really excited to be a part of that. Um, looking forward to referring to it at Summit, though, though my talk there is on, uh, it's on how the cloud never goes down. Ooh. Which is categorically mm -hmm. untrue. But I, it, I was I was I was going to say what a, what a fun uh, week for talking about technology fails. Uh, yeah, no, and and you've got a plan for disaster recovery. I would imagine that's a big part of of that talk and, and how to make sure that you are resilient even within a cloud infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. So there's you know I've I've been a part of engagements where we'll say here's everything you need to do and here's what it's going to cost and they said well I read this article I saw this TV ad whatever I don't need all this other stuff because the cloud never breaks like I, I read this it said it it doesn't break we still have a lot of the same problems we could have had in an on-prem world but we have different tools to solve them and different things to work around because we don't own everything underneath that. So, uh, yeah, excited about some of the nerd stuff as we close the year out, um, doing SQL Saturday Minnesota virtually in December, and then um, hoping to turn my attention to race car stuff after the first of the year, maybe even in Florida, because you oh, can't right. race in Kentucky and Ohio in February. Well, and, and the Sebring race, race uh, occurs down in Florida, in Sebring, Florida. And, and they've got a really interesting race. They've got one where people can enter all types of different cars. I've seen Porsches and all types of other race cars. You do more of a stock car racing though, right? Yeah. So so the Sebring race is, uh, let's say, upmarket from what I do. Those are uh, lots of manufacturers, big budgets, TV coverage, all that. We get web stream coverage. Let's say our budget is much more modest. Sponsors are welcome. Um, but yeah, I race, um, I race basically a, a six year old NASCAR Xfinity car. So like AAA baseball, that's the NASCAR version of that. Wow. And we do road course racing and, um, yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of fun. Um, and I've, I only hit stuff once every six or seven years. So it's, it's good. So I, I, I would love to dig into that for just, just a second. How did you get started with racing? Uh, I, the, my first memories of doing stuff like with family was at, at the racetrack. Like my, my dad had been a crew chief before I was born. Um, and then always ended up working in cars, on cars, around cars, always around the track, always knew people involved in racing something. And I just always wanted to do it. Um, and, and eventually got to a point in my life where I, where I could, cause it is unfortunately not free. And, uh, these days, if you don't get started very early, nobody's going to pay you. So, um, but yeah, it's great. It's I'm really fortunate to be able to have done as as much of it as I have. I I love it whenever I get a I, I see you post, and I'm always excited for you. It's it's an amazing thing to um, just know somebody who's doing that and and to kind of root for them and see their success. So I what one of my favorite things that you do. Um, cool. Let's see. So the, the reason that we're here is the community roundtable. So if you want, what we can do is we can go ahead and kick things off. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt, I, I appreciate you sending over some links. So that way we, we've got content for you in here as well. Uh, first up, I have uh, our host with the most next week, uh, Naraj. Let's see. So sticking to the theme that we had, uh, technology failures. We did discuss about all the technology failures that we had in our personal life. Uh, this is where big companies, right? And big companies have failed. And these are the 20 most successful failures of the lifetime. And we have grown up with this, right? I mean, if you go into this article, 
there are failures like Napster, Blackberries. Uh, oh, I remember and... Napster. Oh, back back in they, they were big ones, right? Music on Napster. Oh. We, yeah, we we, were, we grew up with all this stuff, right? And then they all went uh, down the drain. So yep, uh, had so one of them too. Had one yep. of them. Yep. Okay. And it, it's very as nice a matter of fact, I. It, I remember when the, I mean, I oh my God, from a security standpoint, back in college, when um, the whole network was wide open and we would just go and look through other people's folders and find stuff. And that was how we found the original South Park clip before they were a show of Jesus versus Santa Claus. Um, oh my goodness. What a, what a crazy thing that was. But yeah. Netscape. Oh God! Those were the days, man. Windows eight. <laughs> oh crap! My, MySpace, the internet uh, vacant uh, amusement park. Yes. Right. Yep. Ultra Vista. Wow. <laughs> Google Glass. Google Glass. Yep. I had a Dreamcast. That was actually a great. System. I had that too. That's not a fail. That was a great console. Just not a lot of other people. Thought I don't know that. It. It yeah, I don't know that it was failed. a. It wasn't a technology fail. It was definitely a sales fail. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Segway yeah. was a Darwinism fail. Um, <laughs> Ooh. Well, because oh. well, the, the guy drove himself off of a cliff oh, online. I, I get it. I get okay. it. You know, oh, that's, that's, oh, no, that's, it wouldn't that be my fun. first mention of the Darwin Awards today I either. Just, I, I just remember like um, Bill Gates and some and like three other luminaries, Steve Jobs went into this thing and the guy brought something in a suitcase and he showed them and they came out and they were so impressed. I think like Steve Jobs quote was they're going to build cities around it. Oh, the Segway. It had mm -hmm. so much potential. To be uh, fair, those power boards and segways, I've seen more people in videos failing to ride them than I've seen successfully see. ride them. So, yes, yeah, segway technology fail. Yes. No, it, it absolutely was. So uh, I, I am up next, and I have uh, the resurface tale of uh -huh. how Toy Story 2 was saved after being deleted twice. And, and this is an amazing story for those people that don't know it. I first heard it uh, when I was, oh, I, I can see it in front of me, but I'm blinking on the gentleman's name right now. But um, he ran Pixar and he wrote an autobiography. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I read that autobiography and it had great stories. This was one of the great lessons because he was the CEO of the company and um, somebody had typed in a command. They had deleted everything. They didn't have backups. And the way they saved the movie was that they had one of their animators she was on maternity leave and so they had a network connection and they had copied everything onto her local desktop uh, there was a process that ran and that was where the only copy still resided people drove out to her house they disconnected her her computer from the network they literally put it on a pillow and when they got it to campus he said you know it's just as crazy as you would imagine there were people we had like 16 security guards walking around four people holding a desktop carrying it in there to be able to pull the files off so we can repropagate it through but I, I love it because he said i was asked are we going to find that person and fire them and he said if you look at the expense of this incident he said we easily between all our salary our budget and what we could have lost we spent about 15 million dollars worth of resources in a day coming back from this he goes i don't need to know who it was Whoever it was has learned the most valuable lesson of their career. Mm -hmm. He said, we've learned that we need to have backups. He goes, why would I fire that person and allow some other company to reap the reward of my investment in their learning um, when I could keep them and I could keep that? And I thought, what an absolutely wonderful, positive mental outlook for a boss to be able to have. Um, yeah. Be able to look past that and go, failure is an opportunity to be able to learn. If you're not aware of that business case, again, it's a great business case story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I love one that. I always really enjoy yeah. it. Let's see. Next up, uh, we have Josh Ludeman. Mr. So Ludeman. this, yeah, this is a great blog from a friend of the show. Again, we featured him before, uh, oh, Joey D'Antoni. Would you look at the advertisement that just so happened to be up too? Right oh, there. look at that. It's <laughs> a beautiful Royal Pacific Resort. In a uh, conference center <laughs> on the beautiful by, grounds by the of way, Universal Studios Orlando. Andreas, this is what it looks like right there. And, and there's the boat that takes you to Universal Studios. Um, and inside of there, wonderment awaits. So one day when you when you come I, to I Orlando, we're taking you there. All right. So, sorry, so anyway, this is Joey no, D'Antoni. 
Yeah, yeah. and this is a great blog that it goes through. Um, you know, I think as we all saw at Ignite this year, there was really a focus on security enhancements and really highlighting those. Joey had, does a great job here going through a conversation he had uh, with the PM team um, around Microsoft Authenticator, AD, um, and really the focus on going passwordless and how you get through, you know, how you embark on that journey. Uh, I, I just, from a security standpoint, security has a soft spot in my heart over the last couple of weeks that, you know, um, especially that, you know, it, it, I felt like it was, this was the time to do it. Josh, did you bring this up because Brad did 540 times lose the password for his SQL team? That's, that's what no, I that's why I disqualified him. That's why <laughs> okay. No, no, no. To be fair, that's why Dan disqualified me because I caused him pain um, with that. He was one of the DBAs I worked with who was running around in the background. So, just Not in cool, case man. you forgot, I just want to throw this out there just in case you forgot. There you go. Yeah. I, hey, I, I didn't forget, but I'm requalified for next week. When Naraj is the host, and I'm feeling good about oh, it. Oh, oh, and I, just I as quick as you are requalified. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Tough um, break. You're you're lucky. This is a family show. I got several things to. <laughs> I, I, I'm about to lodge a complaint with Stark Man. <laughs> All right, so Andreas, you're up next. We've got uh, the the mystifying machine learning for industrial IoT applications. Oh my God! This is such a great post by uh, jo uh, Jomit um, Vagala. He does a great job of clarifying so a lot of the interplay that goes on in the state. That when you have industrial IoT applications, you have to connect devices. All those manufacturing devices, they you want to connect to them, pump that into the cloud, um, create time series analysis, anomaly detection, and he shows you the pipeline of how it goes from connecting hot you know, far off, unconnectable machines with um, an OPC a server. Then he shows you through his GitHub how to pump that into one of my passions and Brad's passions, ADX, an ADX cluster. And then he shows you how to tap into machine learning and get some, do some anomaly detection. If you do this, your understanding of IOT, industrial IoT applications and the whole nine yards from beginning to end will totally be clear. Will be, you'll get a full grasp, not totally clarified because some of these things can be quite complicated, but it will definitely make you get you to the next uh, step in your evolution. Excellent. Read this, do the samples. I promise you it is gold. Mm. Very nice, very nice. So uh, next up, we have our, our guest, Matt. Uh, let's see. We have converting Azure UTC date time to user-defined locale and date time by Jamie McGuire. Yes. So before I get to the blog, which is short and sweet, let me tell you how I came to know him. So Jamie was the technical editor on my first book, which was about Azure Cognitive Services, AI, sentiment analysis, speech and language, all that cool stuff. I came to know that subject matter from a blog that I think is now five years old from Mr. Bradley Ball on this call. So that started my journey to this. I got to know Jamie finding tech editors in 2019 for a book on cognitive services, not lots and lots of them. So it was a bit of a challenge, but reached out and that worked out. So I've come to follow his blog, Twitter, all that fun stuff. This one I love because a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, I want to start blogging, but I don't know. I don't want to write a thousand words. I don't want to go into a long thing. This is short and sweet. It's basically like Azure SQL runs on UTC. And if you need to return local times to queries, to other code, whatever, here's how you do it. There's not a lot. There's, there's not a lot of window dressing here. It's just problem you know, solved. Um, so I want to make sure I call this out because A, it's handy and B for anybody that's watching this, that's thinking like, well, blogging, I just, I don't want to write a ton. You don't have to, and you can still write a great blog. Absolutely. And, and breaking, oh, go ahead, Nirash. No, no, that's a nice blog. I mean, I was just reading it out. Really nice. Yeah. Out. Breaking news, this just in, I want to make sure we go over this now in between blog posts. 10 to 1 odds, Brad. Tune in next Tuesday to see if the odds are correct. Where can we you know place what? bets on that? I, I, a uh, friend of mine would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair so, enough. So, so send so it to, to my Venmo. To be fair, 
Andreas has won uh, his second hosting. Nobody has won their own third hosting because Hope won for Josh. So it'll be interesting. I Next. I. Oh, yeah. Naraj has won his third hosting. So, so we'll see who joins Naraj and who joins Andreas Ludeman. It's a race between me and you right now. Um, God, I Go to DraftKings.com. Like there, no <laughs> there is no race. There is no race. We'll we'll see if it's a race. Okay, so, uh, back, back to this. Next up, I've got Naraj. <laughs> Biggest technology failures of 2020. 2020. So 2020 has the COVID year. Even in the COVID years, we had a couple of technologies that failed. Um, COVID test was one of them. Uh, if you go down this blog. Uh, the the facial recognition, which I think Microsoft, Amazon, everybody started declining. Now they don't want to share it out. But yes, that is something. Oh, else. I remember oh, Quibi. Quibi. Yeah. Do you remember Quibi? Quibi Barely. Yep. Yeah, they had some stuff on there where I was like, oh, that could be something. And then COVID and nobody was wanting short videos. And I was like, yep. Yeah, it just went down. Yep. Right. Very quick and easily went down. So, so yeah. very nicely written by uh, Antonio Regalo. Yeah, there were a lot of fails that year. Uh, I mean, but then again, you you look at that whole year, and I I say we just get a mulligan. We, there, there's a do over. Definitely. Um, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, the most anticipated game that never was, yeah, or it cool. was, but it never really did a damn thing. I, I I have seen a lot of blogs about that pop up recently. It's almost as if it has its own cult following that it's continued to utilize it. So I I wonder how much of a failure it actually is looking at whatever numbers it's still doing because it it was a failure so it's probably better than it was but it's a failure because when it first launched it was about as glitchy as what you would expect an alpha build of a game to be um so that was the thing they launched it g you know general release and it was like er, 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 and players would jump across the screen and it was bad oh that's yeah that just sounds awful uh i i never played it uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm up next. I'm going to go with uh, the master because we one of the topics was um, terrifying technology fails. Paul Randall, uh, former Microsoft E, uh, was on the SQL Server product group for a long period of time and is just an all out um, expert in dealing with corruption. And I, I think he's one of like the top people in the world in his firm, SQL Skills. Uh, so he had a great blog and this is back from 2017. So I'm pulling it from the Wayback Machine, but it's dealing with SQL Server corruption. Um, and one of the things that they do is they have a lot of blogs about this, but it talks about don't panic, make sure you go through this. Uh, and, he's, and he's got a lot of great information in here. Um, one of the things, I, I don't know how common this is going to be in the cloud, because the cloud is a very different and interesting space. It has three copies of everything mm -hmm. with HDFS technology underneath the covers. And we have the capability that if there's a corrupt page, we throw that away and we utilize another copy that we had using HDFS, not any native inborn SQL technology. So it's it's very interesting in that I, I haven't really seen this. I think it probably, maybe it would be possible on a virtual machine. I don't know. I haven't seen that much in the cloud, but if you work with SQL Server on-prem, it is not a matter of if, but when. You will encounter this in your career. So it's always good to understand the basics. No, you don't need to panic. Um, and look at what we need to do to be able to make sure that we make it through the process. Um, and, I honestly and they, think, well, I was going to say, I honestly think a DR plan, if the first step in the DR plan mm -hmm. isn't don't panic, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not empathetic and it's garbage because Spot at on. the end of the day, once you're in disaster, everybody's going to panic and you have to kind of remind yourself and them, don't do it. That's the worst thing you can do is step one. But it's human nature to freak out and panic. Well, and there are there's a session that I give where I tell two stories about me panicking. Middle of the night, you wake up, big thing is down, very expensive, customer is mad, and you panic and do the wrong thing. And I made it so much worse. So can speak from very personal experience that that advice is very good. Yeah. Well, it, when, when I worked at Publix, uh, another shout out to them. One of the, um, and I know they've changed it since then, but uh, the way that their individual stores used to work is they had two copies of SQL Server in every store. And the localized transactions from the store would go through an event hub-like uh, technology to be able to get broadcast up to um, their headquarters where they would flow through different things. It was a really amazing architecture. Um, but with the stores, with uh, and they had two SQL Servers per store, over 1,500 stores where we were there, um, we would, if we had to recover one of those things, 
because it was corrupt or the master went corrupt, we were recovering from the tape backup. And you would end up doing that probably once, if not two or three times per on-call. So the level of experience that you got dealing with corruption, recovering, putting SQL Server in single user mode, recovering from master. And then there were, there were some instances where they were SQL 6.5 instances that had been upgraded to SQL 2000, 2005, going through the directories to find the right EXE to be able to do all these individual things. We had a checklist. And um, I can't tell you how many times at 3 or 4 a.m. I'd be like, oh, I've done this so many times. I think I could do it from memory, but let me just check the checklist. And there would always be something I would have missed. Mm -hmm. And I, I was always super thankful for that checklist. So planning for disaster, be calm. You know, that's always a key thing. But the next thing is looking at that and, and having that plan for failure, having that checklist, because it, you never get something that goes wrong at, you know, 4 p.m. right after a backup has occurred on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. it's Friday, right? As you're trying to get to your kid's baseball game or Saturday morning at 4 a.m. That's when things go wrong and, and that mm -hmm. makes it really difficult. All right, so next up, Mr. Josh Ludeman, uh, and he's got this uh, amazing fella named uh, sqlatspeed.com. Uh, I don't know, I, you know I found it. I found this and I thought this is gonna be a great post to do. And then I started looking at it, I'm like, yeah, this guy's a little off. No, just kidding. This is a great blog by Matt. Um, you know, it, it goes back to T-SQL uh, Tuesday, 148. Um, you know, and the official title is the advice of running a user group, but it's a great post on, you know, some of his experiences there. Matt, you want to give a little bit of background on it as well? Well, yeah. And, and, and look at this beautiful shaped face right there. That's what Matt looks like without his beard. Mm. Oh, look at that guy. Face. He looks yeah. horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this was pretty much that, you know, obviously community has been a huge part of my life. Um, it's the reason I am where I am. It's the reason I've gotten to do a lot of the cool stuff that I've gotten to do. Running user groups, especially in the last few years, is very difficult. We've had varying venues, varying ways we're allowed to do this, all this kind of thing. So I wrote it just as encouragement to just keep after it. It's not, it is not easy to do it for the love. Um, and I, you know, I just, I hope people continue with it. It was more to fire other people up and occasionally myself as well. Um, but yeah, this guy's definitely sketchy. So I'm not sure I'd read anything else there. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's a quality blog. I, I like it. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, the next time you're near Josh, you can just kick him. That's fine. He deserves it. Probably. Uh, <laughs> All right. So let's see. Next up after Josh, we have Andreas. Um, let's see. Can you hear me? Something happened to my camera. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your camera's there. I, we were getting a little it's audio feedback. Um, yeah. Yeah. There we go. But, but I, I let, me, let me talk to this one and I'll, I'll come back in and, you know, come back in the show. But uh, for those of you who are excited about, you know, managing device, you, let me start all over. Um, Kubernetes is everywhere. Tons of companies use Kubernetes to manage pods, containers, systems, and then ARC comes into play. ARC gives me that control plane to manage multiple servers, not only in the cloud, but on the edge. Now coming in November, we they're gonna they're gonna actually announce the public preview of AKS Lite. And what's great about AKS Lite, it is gives us now the ability to manage edge devices using Kubernetes. So if you love to live in Kubernetes, if you love what Arc is bringing you with that control plane and managing all that from one central spot, now I can take AKS Lite and manage all those edge devices. And J Jason Farmer does a great job of helping us understand what that whole landscape is. Um, so that's actually coming out in November, AKI Slide. There'll be a public preview. You'll be able to join it. Um, for those of you who are working on the edge, check this out. Absolutely. I'll give that a like. Wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. So let's see. Uh, next up, we have Niraj. And uh, Daraj, uh, we're going back with the central theme of the week. We have mm -hmm. the 10 biggest 21st century, 21st century technology. technology. Yeah. These, are wow. the so, these are the big ones. These are the big ones. So Google Glass was one of yep. them. Uh, if you keep going down, 
the I don't know how many people the, know the, the word. Polis? Polis. The Juicero. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Some of these I've oh, never heard of. Movie oh, pass. Movie pass. Yeah. I got to yep. tell you, I thought, because I love movies. As a matter of fact, I had this one summer where I had a day off, and I spent the whole day in the theater watching, like, dollar movies that I had missed all summer long as I was watching. I thought I was going to like movie pass, but the problem was uh, they, they had no good stuff. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah and, abs absolutely. Well, and I was going to say with the movie pass thing in, in talking about spending all day in a movie theater, I do remember a conversation we had, Brad, either going into Infinity War or Endgame, where there were, there were a chain of movie theaters that were actually going to play every Marvel movie back to back mm -hmm. to back for like a day and a half long to, to put them all back to back to play you into the premiere of, I can't remember if it was Infinity War or Endgame, and we were actually having serious conversations about how we would sit there and, oh, do they have plugs where we could have our laptops and actually um, sit there and, and work and stuff in the back of the room and figure out oh, how yeah. it could happen. It, it, it By the way, they're coming. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's it's funny to think now that Disney Plus has the capability to do a shared watch thing, because we mm -hmm. could have just done that from the comfort of our own living room, but the technology just wasn't there. I mean, at, yeah. at the time Endgame came out, D Disney Plus wasn't a thing yet. No. no. And Movie Pass is coming back, though. Right now, they're coming up with a different plan. Oh, they are? Come back. Oh, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Kind of well, like well, the XFL. They went bankrupt. Somebody bought them, and now they're going to try it again. We'll, we'll have oh, to see if that's you know, works out any better. <laughs> So now we're back over to our guest. We are over to Matt. Uh, Matt, we have uh, Jess Pomfrey uh, log shipping pre-staged database backups with DBA tools. Yeah, I really, really like this one because if you're doing DBA or DBA adjacent things and you're not, if you don't know about DBA tools, you should. And usually the, whenever I say that to somebody, they're like, ah, I don't PowerShell. It's scary, I don't know it. <sighs> DBA tools itself makes it easy, but blogs like this really kind of make it easy to, it's almost like a gateway drug into doing more stuff. Because if you're trying to do a bunch of log shipping at scale, and I actually recently was in a scenario where I had to do this, or actually had to direct some team members to do it alongside me, um, the GUI is not efficient. That's not a good way to do it, right? You're gonna misclick something, you're gonna miss one, whatever. Um, this is clear. And it's basically like, here's how you do it. And it introduces you to some DBA tools uh, code that is going to be helpful. And PowerShell should be a little less scary after you go through this. And you should go try all the other stuff they have. Because it really makes a DBA's life so much easier. Um, DBA, so, DBA tools is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the better open source, uh, open source tools out there in the SQL Server space right now. Yeah. Right? Okay. And I mean, the support is amazing for something that's mm -hmm. absolutely free. Um, you can tweet at it and somebody will answer pretty quick. So yeah, it's just, I just love it. And I want more people to know about it. And Jess is awesome too, so. Yep. Absolutely, Jess, Jess is awesome. So I'm up next, I'm gonna go with Denny Cherry. Uh, can't, you can't beat Denny. Uh, Denny is just a fabulous guy. Uh, love him and, and love all the stuff he does. Uh, Denny's also gonna be at the Pass Summit. So if you're out there in Seattle, say hey to Denny. Uh, if, uh, if you're in Orlando, Florida, uh, tell us and whenever we talk to him, we'll, we'll pass it along. Um, but this is using Azure site recovery for VMDR and SQL manage instance failover groups. Uh, I love this cause he walks through the setup of essentially what they were doing, what the issue was. They had an issue with the IP configuration of the networks that they need to get straight. Uh, he walks through the problem. He walks through what the IP requirements were and the final configuration and how to be able to do this. This is one of those things as well where I, I want to plug ASR because if you're in Azure and you're not using ASR, but you're using a lot of VMs, you, you really should look at it. The capability to be able to have this doing block level copy, and this is not like the old days. Uh, this block level copy is going to get all your database stuff um, and then uh, it's going to move it over. And then you can actually stand up temporary VMs to be able to do a failover test to point your application to validate that the data is coming over in the database correctly. I've, I've helped customers set this up before. And if you really want a failover capability, you have a, a traffic manager in a third region. So that way it routes the traffic you need to go to between your two DR environments. 
Um, but this is this is really great stuff. And if you are not familiar with ASR, that's a technology that you definitely uh, want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have Josh Luneman again. And what do we got here, Josh? So Ben is actually um, an SRE, Site Reliability Engineer at Microsoft. Um, actually, he was brought to me uh, by Dan Taylor, um, who's uh, encountered Ben on some of the projects he's done um, and customers he's worked with in, over his time at Microsoft. He has a lot of great stuff around BICEP and DSC um, with Azure mm -hmm. Infrastructure, um, but really good one, really good uh you know, um, GitHub repo to go to for anything around, you know, infrastructure as code, um, PowerShell, some great PowerShell scripts as well. Um, so great resource. I just wanted to throw it out there because um, talking with Dan recently, he was talking about some of the some of the great interactions and, and, and great customer outcomes he's been able to have using Ben's tools and working with Ben. Excellent. Nice. All right. Next up, we have Andreas. Andreas, we have IoT Edge version 1.1, end of life. Oh. What does that mean for me? No, it means a lot for you. Um, so great post here by Ian Bannum. Uh, for those of you working on the edge using Azure IoT Edge um, and managing Windows containers, you'll want to read this post. Back in August 30th, we uh, uh, the general availability of IoT Edge 1.4 came out. And what that brought right now, you know, the long-term, um, the LTS long-term servicing we had, was the, the previous version, it was IoT Edge version 1.1. And then we went to 1.3, now we're at 1.4. So 1.1 is being put out the pasture. 1.4, what it brought for us was better security, some uh, updates to critical security issues, um, but what I really love about 1.4 is that it does automatic cleanup for unused Docker images because you can have images being loaded on your small device, on your, your, your Percept, on your, uh, your MX, you know, wherever you put these edge modules and they start weighing down the disk space on those devices. So what it does, if the image isn't being used, it'll just actually do the automatic cleanup for you. Um, and then obviously some security patches in there. If you want, re read this because it'll give you a lot of insight of what to do when you're migrating to from 1.1 to 1.4, and especially for if you're leveraging Windows containers. Great post by Ian Benham. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ian. Nice. Yeah, that's post. fantastic. And yeah. and one of the things I saw there in the diagrams on that blog, Andres, that reminded or featured something for me that I just wanted to echo excitement for is, you know, a lot of times Microsoft gets kind of tagged as being a, against the Linux community, but actually um, one of the diagrams in there featured Mariner, which is Microsoft's distribution of Linux that we run in AKS and other things. And so um, I always like to feature that one because there's still a lot of people that, that feel that way. And I just kind of like, put Mariner out there and I'm like, but, but yeah, here. Yeah. It, it, even after all the SQL loves Linux stickers that we came out with several years ago. Yeah, no. There's still all right. some individual. <laughs> 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 we got some old ads. All right. Last up, uh, we have Matt once again, and uh, we have uh, SQL Server Fast by Hugo Cornelius. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I wanted to, call attention to here. Um, first of all, Hugo's been blogging. I think you said he's a 13-time MVP. He's been blogging yeah. a very long time. Um, Since I think 2006. Almost, that's what I, oh, I was thinking it was 15 years, 16. Wow. So yeah. I remember reading Hugo's blogs before I knew anything about SQL Family and knew that there were conferences and Data Saturday, SQL Saturdays, all that. There's so much good information in here. Um, so for folks that didn't know, I wanted to call attention to that lots of good performance tuning stuff and it's funny even as as i see my friends move away from dba stuff to like data engineering and kind of other facets sometimes you have to make a query go faster even if you're not uh you know doing only that so great great stuff here um hugo is also in a pretty tough health fight so we wanted him to know that we're thinking about him um yeah. and despite all of that he's doing something i think the the blog post went live october 9th but it's still on where he is donating some proceeds of his training courses uh to a 
it's a leukemia research society um, and also offering some discounts. And his post goes into all of this about kind of what all of the, all the different arrangements are, but he's helped me and so many others over the years. So I want to give him a shout out here um, and also let folks know that there are some ways that you can help him and he can help you too. Yeah. And nice. Hugo is just such a great person. He's a wonderful man. Uh, I've met him so many times throughout different community events at conferences at MVP summits. Uh, we, we can't say anything more than if he's out there and he sees this, we absolutely love you and we wish you the best. You're the first or last baby in the spirit of Ricky Bobby and performance <laughs> tuning. <laughs> well, he's definitely first then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's it for, for our roundup today. Uh, a couple of reminders on Tuesday show, Naraj is our host, um, a fair and just host. If ever I've known one and I am looking forward to not being Josh for a change, uh, sign up for SQL <laughs> Saturdays. I think there's one coming up on the 5th of November. Go to SQLSaturday.com. Uh, no, you didn't. Um, yeah. Like I said, lots of uh, the Raj is the winner. That's right. We can keep that one up there. I'm good with that. Because if anybody, Naraj was our first host because it only made sense because he's Naraj. Uh, go to SQLSaturday.com. Find out what's going on in the community. Um, special guest joining us next week, we have Andrew Nathan. He is a principal engineering mm -hmm. manager and veteran. We will, uh, we, we're not going to talk about the topic yet, but I know Naraj has a good one. And uh, we are going to be looking towards next uh, week. We're on the 11th. It is Veterans Day, and we definitely want to thank our veterans out there for their service, and we want to uh, make sure that we acknowledge them and, uh, and we thank them for everything they do. One more reminder, Live 360 is less than two weeks away. The Path Summit is less than two weeks away. Uh, Tales from the Field has a pre-recorded session, which I believe may be available early uh, with some of the SQL Server product group uh, pre-recorded sessions. Uh, and it's going to be called Migrations to Azure SQL Tales from the Field. Uh, me and Naraj and Andreas and Josh got together to be able to put together that presentation for you. Mm -hmm. uh, for Live 360, go to aka.ms slash Live 360 to go straight to our pre-con page so you can see the hands-on workshop that Buck, Woody, myself, and Josh Ludeman have together. Um, and where's that going to be, Josh? <laughs> Deep. You got it. You got it. He's in <laughs> oh, he's on mute. He doesn't realize he's on, he's mute. on mute. Yeah, the whole is. time. Oh my God, this is fantastic. This is he great. He doesn't realize he's on mute. He's still going. Don't you did. I was oh, muted oh, and it was oh, great. I think it was really good. It, you were into it. I think you oh, sold God. it now. It's, it, it's at the beautiful Lowe's Royal Pacific <laughs> Resort and Conference Center on the you sprawling did. grounds yeah. of yeah. Universal Studios Orlando. <laughs> If it, if I didn't talk to the mute button, it's not a true virtual session. It's not. I, I, that's someone has to talk to mute. Ever done, right? It, it's if someone has to talk to mute, I'm glad it's me. <laughs> Although Brad should talk to mute more often. I probably should. Uh, I, I I'm sure that would be a, a good thing for me to talk to mute more often. Is is there anything, gentlemen, that uh, no. that you can think of that we need to cover? Uh, just, just that. I just want to say that I'm really proud that I wasn't disqualified. I think that's a good thing. So thanks for having me. We're not doing mm -hmm. yeah, I, It's definitely good not to be disqualified. disqualified All right. Brad. Thank you, everybody. You Have a great weekend. We Hashtag will see you again on Tuesday. Brad. Brad's disqualified. disqualified. Yep, Brad's disqualified. Wake up. 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 Wake up.